Welcome back to another episode of Heaven and Healing Podcast. I'm Angela. Today, this conversation takes place with my sister in Christ, all the way in the UK, Nayla Rose. Nayla is an ex-occultist with a background in womb worship, menstrual magic, psychic mediumship, goddess work, yoga, you name it, she did it, all before Jesus plucked her out of the deception that she was living in. In this episode, we talk about the God-shaped hole in all of us how each of us have this innate longing within to be fulfilled and how God is the only thing that can fulfill that longing or else we will try and try and try and find it with things of the world and only continue to be left empty with that longing. So this episode is rich, it is deep, it is emotional and it really taps into the truth that God is the only person, the only being, the only love that can fill that void. We hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome back to another episode of Heaven and Healing Podcast. I'm Angela and I'm here with my friend Naya. Nayla. Nayla. <laughs> See, you just told me and I already forgot. Nayla, my sister in Christ. Um, we connected on Instagram and I just felt a kinship immediately when I saw her testimony. Uh, we have a lot to talk about today. We're going to talk about the God shaped hole in all of us and what that means and take it from there to see where this conversation will flow. First, I'm going to hand it over to her and let her share her testimony. So Nayla, will you tell us how you came to Christ? Yes, thank you so much for having me. Um, so, I mean, it's a long story <laughs> how I came to Christ, but um, I'm sure we're going to unpack that as we talk about the God-shaped hole, because that's really how it started for me. All my life, I've just been longing and looking for God. And um I looked for him in all the wrong places. Um, as a child, I looked for him um, in the creation. So I was just like fixated on nature. And um, then as I became a teenager, I looked for him in other people and relationships and um, music and drugs and just any place that I could feel something. I was just looking for something to fill that God-shaped hole, that aching in me. And that led me to such a destructive lifestyle of partying and self-harm and drug use and toxic relationship. And I got myself into such a mess. I was absolutely um, riddled with anxiety and depression. I was suicidal. And so because I was so unhappy, I ended up looking for healing. Again, I was looking for God in the new age. And so that led me into yoga which led me into all kinds of occult practices, um, which over the course of about eight years, nine years, culminated in me becoming a new age teacher myself. So um, the way that I would study new things was actually to teach them. I became a life coach. I became um, a yoga teacher. I became a spiritual mentor. And I began to teach everything that I had learned um, in new age. And I got deeper and deeper into the occult to the point where I was in such darkness and I was about to have the week that Jesus came to me, the week that he saved me, I was about to have like an enormous serpent tattooed down my arm and an ankh on the other arm. And I had, you know, it was really just going to be like a symbol, like a seal of how deep I'd gone into the dark feminine arts and into um, the occult and a few days I had actually booked my appointment to have these tattoos and a few days before I went to do that Jesus saved me and he literally just like pulled me out of the darkness I mean I went from one day chanting and channeling Mary Magdalene and all kinds of other demonic spirits and um, doing mediumship uh, over the phone with my clients to the next day being a born-again Christian I mean he just like a lightning bolt he just came and struck me in the spirit and I was born again so then I had to dissolve and um, uh, give up my new age business and cancel all of my programs and um, let my employees go and and tell my clients I can't do this anymore Jesus is the only way to God 
I found him. I found the way to God. You know, everything I've been looking for my whole life, this is it. And um, because of that, it changed my whole life. I, I, I let go of my business, my home, relationships, everything changed. And I um, moved countries to be near a, a church that I was in fellowship with when I came to Christ. And now I, I live to give my life to him, to serve the kingdom, to share the gospel. And um, it's just a miracle what he's done. <laughs> Amen. Now, when you say he plucked you, did you, um, were you feeling like despair? Was there, were you calling out for something? What was that experience like for you when it just shifted? Mm. How did you realize it was Jesus? Yeah, I had a, one of, one of the things I love the most about the way that Jesus works and the way that Holy Spirit comes to save us is so unique. I've never heard one testimony the same in terms of how right. the Spirit contacts us. And I had a, an unusual encounter. I actually, a year before I was plucked out um, and actually born again, a year before I had an encounter with Jesus. And I had just come out of another yoga retreat and another um, kind of immersion training in one of these um, Bali retreats that I was um, co-facilitating and I was doing some training myself and I was trying to like deepen my spiritual practice and level up and get the new codes and, you know, find that next level of fulfillment. And I came back from the training and I just felt so empty, so mm. depressed. I'm still empty. Like, when am I going to actually reach the truth that I'm looking for? So then I started to um, pray to the universe um, in Sanskrit, actually. I was chanting in Sanskrit every day, but with the intention that I'm praying to God, the universe, I need the ultimate truth. Give me the ultimate truth. I just started crying out in desperation. Like, I have tried every occult practice. I have tried every spiritual door and every religion, and I'm still empty, I need the truth. So I did have that desperation then where I was really crying out to the universe to show me the ultimate truth. And I did that for about three weeks, I think, every morning um, as part of my spiritual practice. And then I had an encounter with Jesus. So I was crying for the truth and the truth appeared in front of me. Um, it was kind of like a vision, but it was very real. It felt as real as like, I'm seeing you right now. And I knew that he, he, that it was Jesus. And I had no Christian background. I'd never read the Bible. I had not been looking for Jesus. But as soon as he appeared in front of me, I knew that this was Jesus. Mm. And um, and so that that experience was so profound. I mean, he was literally just radiating like the sun. And I felt an instant healing in his presence. And I was so moved by it. But I wasn't born again then, which I think is, you know, a lot of people have said to me, shouldn't you have been like born again instantly? But I wasn't. I, it was a brief encounter and it just it just opened my heart. But then he left. The, the experience ended and I was so hungry for more that I actually ended up going, OK, I just met Jesus. I need to find out more about Christ. And I dived even deeper into New Age. So I went into Christ consciousness. I, because I had come from a, a a divine feminine rising background and I had come from goddess worship and I had come from everything being about womb work and about the feminine I started thinking okay I need to find like this feminine divinity this feminine connection with Christ so I ended up getting sucked even deeper into new age I started to study Christ consciousness obs obsessively I became completely um transfixed with the goddess Sophia and I started to channel Sophia Christ and all of that um, all of that false teaching so my because I didn't have any Christians around me no one to say hey read the bible you've just met the son of God I went looking for him in the places I thought I could find him which was my occult surrounding so when I finally was born again it felt to me as though you know, for nine months, I had been going deeper into new age with Christ consciousness. And like I said, I was about to just have these tattoos and these other really demonic symbols put on my body to signify my allegiance to Satan. I didn't know that. 
time that's that's what it was and i really felt like jesus plucked me out because i was about to go into a point of no return like i had gone so far into the dark and the rescue mission that he did on my soul was at that point had nothing to do with me i wasn't praying you know jesus help me i was i was actually feeling empowered channeling all of these demonic spirits and I was making good money and I was feeling like I'd found my sole purpose but I was going so deep into witchcraft I feel like he just came and it was like a lightning bolt I didn't have any choice I was just ripped out and suddenly I my eyes were unblinded and I could see and I remember looking up out of my window and I just heard the words come out of my mouth Jesus is the only way to God and I just mm. knew that was true so um yeah my journey you know it took a year and i think that it's worth people knowing that because sometimes you have an instant encounter with god and you're you're saved and sometimes you just continue to rebel against him in and 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 go down the wrong path but he's faithful to come for you you know he doesn't give up on on us and those who who he's called and those who he's predestined he does not give up he comes for you he's um He's the God who leaves the 99 to go after the one lost sheep. Mm -hmm. He really, he really did persevere with me. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) I relate to that because I had the same idea of Jesus as far as Christ consciousness goes. And it makes me cringe to even think about the way I spoke of him. (sighs) You know, especially because, you know, astrology was my thing. So I was saying, Jesus, you know, God wants us to do astrology and we can kind of channel Jesus in that way. And it was, Mm -hmm. but my first encounter with Jesus, it was similar in so much that I wasn't born again the first time I experienced him or the first time I really Mm -hmm. opened my heart to him because I would say around early October, late September of 2021 is when I started to see God as a part of everything you know, as far as the new age goes. Um, And I wanted to put him first, but I didn't want to abandon the new age practices. So he was a part of it, um, but it was still the idol of him that I created in my mind. Mm -hmm. And I thought I had it figured out. You know, I was like, well, great. Now Jesus is a part of my life, but I also have astrology. I still have my crystals. Now I can talk to Jesus with the crystals and things like that. And it wasn't until about, I don't know, October, November, December, January, it was like four months after that, when I, I, I just felt convicted one day I had spoken with, I did actually have someone tell me, um, on Instagram, I reached out to him and he told me, listen, astrology is not it. Like you're not finding God in there. And Mm -hmm. the verse he sent me, um, Isaiah, it was something from Isaiah 47, about how the astrologers are like, will burn in their own fire. (laughs) Um, Yeah. (laughs) The next day I woke up and I called my best friend sobbing who had been a Christian our whole lives. And she was always praying for me. Um, I I said, I'm ready. I'm giving it up. I'm giving it up. And I I would say in that moment was when I was really born again, because I acknowledged he was it. So I do like that you mentioned that because you're right. It doesn't always happen right away. Um, I really like this image of, if you think about a flower, how, how do you grow a flower? You use a watering can, right? You don't Mm. use a fire hose. It doesn't come to life with a fire (laughs) hose. You know what I mean? So sometimes that's how Jesus needs to work on our hearts when they've been hardened for so long, just needs to gently water us over and over. Yes. And I think, especially for those of us coming from new age, because you know, I, I had a decade of experience with spiritual practices that felt like this is what spirituality is. Like, this is what it means to be spiritual. This is what it means to commune with something higher, something divine. And so I didn't have a context for um, the, the the biblical way to see Christ because I wasn't raised, um, in, I was raised in the occult. I came from the occult. So that was my idea of spirituality so when I met Jesus I sort of tried to fit him into my practices instead of giving up my practices and turning towards him and actually Mm -hmm. getting to know who he was and so I think you know when you're coming from new age 
um, you're so programmed, like any cult that you that you exist within, that um, this is the problem. So many people today believe themselves to be in a relationship with the living God, Jesus Christ, but they are practicing all the occult practices I was doing, you were doing astrology, yoga, you know, um, tantra, reiki. They're doing all these things and then believing that they actually know Jesus when Jesus himself in his word says that if you do those things, you cannot know him. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a real common issue for new ages coming to know God that we try and fit the idol of Jesus or the concept of Jesus into our pagan practices and that will never work. Yes, Satan deceives the biblically illiterate. <laughs> yes, yes. And like my people suffer for or perish. My people perish for lack of wisdom. That really. Um, mm. Wow. Yes. I. So let's talk about, you know, what even leads us to the new age, right? What leads us to not only the new age, but for people that may not even necessarily believe in a spiritual sort of presence you know, leads them to drugs or mm -hmm. pornography or alcohol or yeah. depression, you know, excessive screen time, any of these things that we immerse ourselves in mm -hmm. because we are looking for God. So would you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. So I really um, believe and know that all of us have a God-shaped hole in our heart. And so we are going to be, we are programmed, God created us to long for him. And so there's no exception. It's not like, oh, I'm a spiritual person, therefore I have a God-shaped hole in my heart. But, you know, the next person who says they're fine without him or they don't care about spirituality um, is in a different situation. No, every human being was designed to worship God. And so if you don't have any sensitivity to that because maybe you were raised in a in a situation where spirituality was not encouraged or you know you were encouraged to hate God like so much of the secular world then you're just going to experience the longing but you don't know mm -hmm. what it is you long for so you have this longing everyone has it I mean every single human has this aching for something and it's like a desire to be full a desire to be whole and so if we don't understand what that longing really is, we're going to try and fill it with something. So that that hunger, we might try and fill it with food. We might try and fill that longing with sex or relationship or clothes or money or sport or taking drugs. It doesn't matter, like anything, people, relationships. There's so many ways that we can try to sort of fill that hunger in us. But we know that that doesn't work because we always end up hungry again, no matter how great that relationship was for the first six months, then when it ends, you feel empty. No matter how incredible that night on the, when you were out taking drugs was, the next day you feel empty. Um, no matter how much you eat, you're always hungry again. It's not fulfilling. And so this God-shaped hole in our heart, I always compare it to like those, you know, those children's toys where you have to match the shape to the correlating mm. shape like the baby toy. And what we're doing as human beings when we're living apart from God is we're like trying to fit the, the square into the triangle and it just, it's not going to work. You might temporarily kind of like jam it in there and just think it's okay, but there's all these cracks and it doesn't fit, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't work. And so you can keep trying to fill that void, that God void in you with stuff and things um, but it will never work. So I think that, you know, that's what leads people into self-destruction. That's what led me into self-destruction. I had this deep ache, this deep longing for, for more. I wanted to feel full. I wanted to feel whole. I wanted to feel home. I wanted to feel love. And so I was looking for that in any place, any stimulant I could get, whether that was money, drugs, sex, you know, things that give you like a temporary high, which incidentally are highly addictive. So then you keep thinking, well, if I just do more of it, that's going to work. Um, and it never works. I mean, ask any drug addict, ask any serial monogamist if they found what they were looking for yet, you know, or ask any sex addict, ask anyone who abuses food. Like, have you have you found it yet? Do you feel full? Do you feel whole? Mm. 
no they have to keep doing more mm -hmm. and, um, so that's what leads people into self-destruction because I became a drug addict an alcoholic mm -hmm. I became um, completely suicidally depressed and just like looping in these negative behaviors and then like I said at the beginning you know the only thing that felt like it could rescue me from that was oh, okay I need to find spirituality so yoga you know yoga became my my salvation but it was just the same I was trying to fill that god-shaped hole with yoga and that will never work either um so I, I just felt empty I felt I felt empty every single day of my life until I met until that day when I was born again and I knew that Jesus was the son of God and then it was like the circle went into the circle shape mm. it's just a fullness and a wholeness that never stops like the other thing about this um filling the god-shaped hole with stuff with money with relationships with things is that it gives you temporary relief you know you might feel great for a day a week maybe even six months but eventually you find yourself in deficit again and you have that need to fill up with jesus with a real relationship with the living god who made me to long for him I never go into deficit, even when the external situation changes, when I'm, when I'm sick, when I'm down, when I have troubles, when I get spiritually attacked, when life is hard, there's a fullness in my soul that only the lover of my soul can fulfill. So um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a real, it's a real problem because everyone's walking around with this God-shaped hole and if they're not filling it with God, they're going to fill it with things that the Bible says leads to death, all of this sin and all of this self-harm and destructive behavior. Amen. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've had this experience, um, but there have been, you know, when you come to Christ, you're a new creation. It says that in the Bible. Yes. I'm very different than I was a year ago. I'm very different than I was six months ago. I've had people that love me tremendously tell me, you're not interested in this anymore. You're not interested in that anymore. You know, I, I don't even know who you are anymore. Like, yeah. do you, do you care about anything else? And the, what I was just thinking about this as you were speaking, because it's not that I don't have interests anymore. It's not that, you know, I, I don't want to do other things. It's that I'm not seeking in those other things anymore. Yes. And that's what you notice is different about me. And that's mm. why those things are no longer the centerfold of my life is because, you know, I'm not looking for my salvation in a Taylor Swift song anymore. <laughs> and I'm not looking for salvation in, you know, how, how nicely my house is decorated today because it's going to make my anxiety feel better. You know, things like that. It's mm -hmm. Christ is that it's exactly what you said, how even when the outside world, even when the circumstances are not the best or not the most ideal at the time, that mm -hmm. emptiness is not there. Yes. Even if there's some sadness. Exactly. And that emptiness, we all know it. We've all experienced it. It is so painful. It is such an uncomfortable feeling that emptiness that we compulsively must do something to fill yes. it to soothe it to numb it and so you know if we're not if we're not filling that with something nourishing and sustaining and and what it was made for you know if we're not putting that circle shape into the circle shape then we're always substituting with something else um but yeah i totally understand what you're saying it's the same for me it's not that i don't have interests it's not that i don't have other longings it's not that i spend all day only thinking about jesus although i try to because he's amazing and when i do i have peace so i really should but you know life is distracting and life is full and it's not that i am incapable of looking at other things it's just that i'm not seeking my identity or my worth or my belonging or my fulfillment in anything except for jesus and um, so I can hold them lightly. Things can come into my life and I can, I can hold them lightly with an open palm because I'm not trying to grab onto them and then fulfill myself through them. Um, and even things I'm very passionate about, things I love, um, they just don't compare to the, the level of... Um, satiation that you feel in your soul the level of love 
and and fullness and joy and peace that you feel in Christ cannot be um, beaten. It cannot be uh, topped by anything. So you also stop seeking because you know that nothing can ever fill you in the way that God does. I mean, that's something that the Bible says that this, the Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are ch a child of God. There's this spiritual knowing that you are home, that you have found it, that you that you that you're done. It is finished. Mm. <laughs> so you're not looking anymore. You're not seeking uh, in in the world. You're seeking God. You're thinking. You're seeking things above. You're seeking your savior in every moment and you're seeking to be reunited with him in heaven so you know as the bible says that then we stop thinking about earthly things so much and we think of heavenly things um and this is all a supernatural occurrence we can't make this happen we can't just like think our way into this we have to be born again by the spirit of god right and you know it's I I was thinking about Genesis when we were preparing to have this conversation because, you know, the third the first three chapters of Genesis is really just the foundation of humanity and just the Bible in and of itself and the relationship that we have to God, and in you know I like to use the aquatic realm and the plant realm as an example of how that demonstrates how much we need him. Because in Genesis 1.11, God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And then 120, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open firmament of heaven. So, what mm. happens when you take a fish out of water? What happens when you rip a tree out of the earth? It dies. And then we have Genesis 126. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, 27. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he, him, male and female, he created them. So just as the earth, I'm sorry, just as the trees need the earth, just as the fish need the water, you know, God used those to demonstrate to us these things need X, Y, Z in order to sustain itself. Now I've created man and woman in my image because you, man and woman, need me to sustain yourself. And when we remove ourselves from God, that same thing happens to us spiritually. That would happen to your goldfish if you took it out of its tank, right? You die. You die spiritually. And humans, as you said, have this inborn spiritual yearning because we literally can't do it without him because we are creation. And as the creation, we do need our creator. And <clears throat> the Lord is really the essential ingredient for that satisfied innate you know spiritual appetite to be fulfilled mm -hmm. you know john 14 verses four through five talks all about how he is um the vine that's one of my favorite verses in the whole bible he says abide in me and i in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine no more can you except you abide in me I am the vine, Jesus says, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Mm. I mean, nothing. It's just so simple. Yeah. And it's so experienced. Like if you, if you just, if anyone looks honestly at their life, they'll see that they can't do anything apart from God. You know, that no matter how much temporary success they achieve in, in the natural, like financial success or, you know, whatever it is, it, it, it never fills that deep soul longing, you know. And I think a lot of people have identified that now as love. So they think that comes through romantic love. And so no matter how successful they are in their careers and stuff, they always end up longing for romantic love. But 
we all know that even romantic love, once the high wears off, it's not, it doesn't touch the sides of that God shaped hole. Mm -hmm. There's something deeper and it's a soul longing um, that it, it just simply cannot be filled with things of the flesh. It cannot be filled with things of the world. Um, and I think I, I have a piece of scripture from Revelation that echoes what you just shared about um, his, his creating everything. So um, it's, uh, it's Revelation 4, 11, and it says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou has created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. So this, this is a piece of scripture that for me really um, expresses the reality of everything he did in Genesis, everything you've just shared. He created it all for his own pleasure. This tells us that God delights in us. Like he literally made us, you and me, all mankind, because he wanted to love us and spend time with us and delight in us. And he made us to have that same longing for him. We want to know him. And uh, it's, it, it, it leads me on to what I was saying to you um, just before we started about worship, because God designed us to worship him. Mm -hmm. He made us to worship him. That is actually the reason we exist. And so we have this like hard wiring to worship. And the issue with our godless world, our godless culture is that we think that only people who love God are going to worship. Only people who like, you know, have a spiritual connection with something higher are going to go into worship. But actually all human beings are designed to worship and all human beings will worship. So the question is not, do I want to worship God or not worship at all? The question is, what am I worshiping? Because you will worship something. If you don't worship the God who gave you life and like pour your energy into him and just praise him and look to him for your fulfillment, you will worship money, food, sex, you know, people, relationships, places, sports, cults. You will find something to worship. And every single person I've met worships something. Um, even if they have no idea they worship it. And sometimes it's really obscure right. things that people worship, you know, <laughs> like things that you think, well, I wouldn't worship that. I'm not interested in that at all, but they just, they just give it everything they've got because we're made to, we're made to worship. And um, so when I realized that, I realized that there's also like a, a vulnerability to being a human being and not knowing God because you're going to worship the wrong thing if you don't mm -hmm. worship him. You can't help it. <laughs> he made you to worship. And so this is why people who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who don't know the living God, they just end up worshiping whatever's in front of them. And we, like we see all through the Old Testament, people create idols and they worship the creation instead of the creator. I mean, in the new age, you're considered spiritual if you worship the creation, if you worship the sun and the trees and the ocean. Um, but this is basic paganism that we see all through the Old yes. Testament. Worshiping the creation instead of the creator is like praising the painting on the wall instead of giving credit to the painter who spent hours and hours creating that perfect painting. Um, so you know, when, when we consider that we're built to worship, we have to really start to ask ourselves, you know, what am I worshiping? Um, and if it isn't from God, then it's from the antichrist. It's from Satan. If you're not worshiping things of the light, you're worshiping things of the dark because there is only light and dark. Right. There's no, there's no gray, <laughs> even though the new age likes to say, you know, God is gray. There's no gray. There's light and there's dark. Mm -hmm you're not worshiping the light you're worshiping the dark so yeah I really hope that someone watching this will really consider that because you can't avoid worship is part of the human nature amen I flash back to my old podcast I'm not sure if you're aware of this I had I had an entire podcast dedicated to just self-healing and astrology one of my episodes, I literally talk about how life is lived in the gray. 
<laughs> life has lived in the gray area. Nothing is black and white. You know, there's, oh man, it's insane, the deception. And I what you say is true, because if you think about people, for instance, that will say, oh, we don't need God or God's not real, you know, they're not always degenerative kind of lifestyle people. You know, these, these can be very intelligent people with PhDs yeah. that are intellectual and teachers, things like that. But look at their lifestyle. You know, they drink a lot. They watch porn when their wife isn't home, mm -hmm. things like that. Their marriage has collapsed five times. There's yeah. always, even the people that think they don't need God are still suffering and are yeah. still looking for something. And like you said, even if it's unbeknownst to them, they're still searching. Yeah. And the thing about God is that he really kind of makes you not even God, but the Bible really makes you sort of confront that within yourself, say, where have I been looking? And mm -hmm. I think that's why a lot of the time people tend to not to stray off track, but people tend to reject God because they don't want to confront that that hole. Mm -hmm. They don't want to confront that void and they don't want to look at the ways that they've been filling it because it's too hard to face. When yes. the truth is, if you face it and if you face God, he will ease you of that. He will forgive you for the ways that you've been trying to self-soothe mm -hmm. and self-pacify and he will bring you peace. Yeah. And it's a, it's a miracle. He's a miracle. And it, it's, you know, when you can really register what you said that he created us for his own sake, for his own pleasure. There is such a, there's such a tenderness and a warmth to that because mm -hmm. he just loves us. He yeah. loves us so much, yeah, so much. And he will never force you to love him, but he designed you to do so. Yeah. And I have, have here, um, before you go on Zephaniah three seventeen. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. You know, joy. Yes. That word joy over and over in that verse. He, he loves us. And nothing compares to that love. Nothing. You know, no. I, never, I never understood it before. <laughs> Yeah, because his love is truly unconditional, you know, like unconditional love just loves you even if you don't love that, you know, if you don't love back. And um, I know God's love is conditional. We can say it's conditional in the sense that he cannot love sin. Mm -hmm. But he actually lo has loved us as sinners so much that he sent his only son to die for us. Like he loves us that much. And like you said, he there's no, um, there's no love without freedom. So he'll never force mm -hmm. us to love him back, but he made us to love him. And then he wants us to use the free will he gave us to choose him. Um, you know, it's the same as if like, if I wanted a man to love me and I put a, a love potion in his drink and then he fell in love with me, I would never feel like he really loved me because in the back of my mind, I would know that I made him do it. I manipulated him into doing it and it's the same like god would never force us to love him because then it wouldn't be love he wouldn't really know that we've chosen him if he made us love him so he's given us free will which is such a gift he's given us a free will and i can use my free will to do whatever i want you know people who think that it god is controlling because he has standards and because he doesn't um allow he doesn't have anything to do with sin because he's perfect and he won't make covenant with sin. People think he's controlling, but he has literally given us free will that we can actually do whatever we want with. I can do whatever I want. I can choose to disobey God or I can choose to obey him. And he will let me do either, either one I choose. And But there's, a, there's a, actually a law written on my heart, as the Bible says, God has written his law on our hearts. There's actually a, a, a deep knowing in my soul that, it's him I want. <laughs> it's him I want. And um, so if, if, if you're really honest with yourself, you know that it's God you long for. But the reason I think people reject God, I mean, there are so many, it's pride. 
but something you came you mentioned a minute ago is like oh i don't need god and you know maybe you consider yourself an intellectual maybe your life is successful on the outside so you think i don't need i'm not longing i don't need anything i think that, i think the reason people reject god and have hard hearts toward him is because we've actually in our pride as a species we've made it really um taboo to be like vulnerable enough to really need a savior and we've also made it taboo to be in obedience so we have taught through our culture and especially through new age self mastery self realization self actualization self empowerment you know your it's your life make it happen and it's actually considered to be like um disempowering to be in a desperate need of help and also to choose to obey those two things you know when i first came to the lord i had a, had this radical just paradigm shift in the way that i looked at obedience suddenly obedience was the most empowering thing i could do but before i thought that being submissive to a higher power and being totally obedient was something that um only people who were too afraid to take control of their own lives would do you know people who wanted to kind of like put the responsibility on someone else no it, it takes so much strength to truly surrender and let yourself feel how much you need how much you need love how much you need help mm. you know you like none of us are strong enough to just go through life without um the love of our creator it breaks us it breaks us down it, it destroys our souls over time we actually desperately need god and we desperately need god's love because he created us to love us he created us to need him um and then i i think i had one here psalm 70 uh verse 4 may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you may those who love your salvation say evermore god is great so when we actually seek god and when we say oh i need you i'm so desperately painfully lonely and my heart aches for something that i can't even describe when we seek god we come into a joy and a gladness that can only be given in that intimate connection in that intimate relationship with god there's no human relationship there's no job promotion there's no amount of sex or drugs or rock and roll or or earthly pleasure that will ever give you that joy that just supernatural peace and joy that you experience when you seek your savior when you seek god and uh it, it it's just everything that the world told me a, a religious walk um like with with god following his commandments reading his word i had such a negative opinion of that i thought that obedience was dirty and i thought that um it was just like a, a, some kind of trap and it's so the opposite like everything i was taught is the opposite walking with god is freedom complete submission to jesus christ is the most empowering and liberating thing that any of us will ever experience but um yeah the the bible says that the devil has deceived the whole world and he's flipped that and made it seem like <sighs> obedience to god is something that isn't empowering or right. isn't fun or isn't sexy right <laughs> it's, it's not it's not what people want to do mhm mm that's but that's because of our sin that's because of our pride once you actually like surrender all of your own self righteousness and all of your own pride and admit that you are in need you have a deep longing in you that nothing you do can fill and you've tried everything and you're still hungry and you're still empty um then god can come in cuz he he wants a, a humble and a contrite heart to be able to work on and yeah i guess for me i had to get to that point where i said i i surrender i can't mm. i can't fix myself nothing i'm going to do nothing i have done um works you touched on so many important aspects there <laughs> you know 
first, you know, what you said about how he doesn't like sin. I always say his love is unconditional, but his tolerance is not. Um, yeah, that's good. And there is that that is further a showcase of his love because it's it's what you said you know he he lets us do as we will and i loved the metaphor of the love potion that's that's too real um and it's what you said how the obedience it's not made out to be this empowering aspect of life you know to i used to think people oh you want to live your life by what the bible says you do you but i'm going to do me and not follow a set of rules um mm -hmm. you know it's like people think of it as this playbook for life and i was not about that i wanted to live my truth you know as we know mm -hmm. a very popular expression in this world but um the thing is going back to the beginning of our conversation you know you don't you don't chastise a fish for needing its water you don't chastise mm -hmm. your your plants for needing their soil to grow so it's mm -hmm. the same thing with us that we need not be chastised or or judge ourselves for needing our Lord and Savior, for yes. acknowledging that there's a Savior at all. Yes. When the truth is, the evidence of our needing God is all around us. I said this in my last episode, walk out your front door and tell me that this is a world that doesn't need God, because yeah. that world out there is the direct result of those that claim they don't need him, of those mm -hmm. that reject him, of those that are self-worshipping or worshipping money, mm -hmm. you know, worshipping money, worshipping science, if you will, worshipping mm -hmm. the next thing, mm -hmm. right? You know, we all have our, think about these movements um, in, in our culture, you know, that we are ushered by the media to support, hashtag this, hashtag that you know, worship, it's all worship. It's a way for us to feel, to feel fulfilled temporarily, temporarily by feeling like we're doing something good, mm. feeling like we're serving a higher purpose, something outside of ourselves. So, you know, that's the whole, that's what society is all about yeah. is because the people in charge, the higher ups, the elites, they know, they know of God because they are of the devil. And so they know that we have that longing. And so they give us these things to kind of mm -hmm. pacify that wound. Nothing that will ever ultimately fill it, but to pacify it in the short term, as you said, you know, you might feel good for a day or a week or six months, but ultimately you're going to need more of it. You're going to have to keep coming back to whatever it is, whether it's a social justice movement, whether it's drugs, whether it's education, travel, things that seem on the surface really, really good. And they are good. You know, I'm not saying we shouldn't travel or pursue an education, but we don't need to find our identity in these things because that's not where our true identity lies. And as far as the Bible goes, you know, it kind of lays the foundation for us as what it means to be a human being that is in need of God. And that's why God gave it to us. And I'd like mm -hmm. to equate this to sort of, you know, when you buy a new piece of equipment, you know, I'm going to take myself as example with this, this whole contraption I have set up here, my webcam, I'm using my regular camera, right? I have no idea how to do that when I got it. I had no idea how to set that up. So what did I have to do? I had to go through the steps, I had to look through the manuals, right? So when you buy a new piece of equipment, you don't know how to use it. It comes with a manual and it explains how to get the best use and satisfaction out of your acquisition. Mm. That is the Bible. Mm. It is the manual for human life that God, the manufacturer has made for us, the user. Amen. There's nothing oppressive about it. You know? No, it would be like saying it's oppressive to expect me to read the instructions for putting up this shelving unit from Ikea. Like that's so oppressive. I need to just figure it out and do it my way. You just wouldn't do that. You would you would want to put it up the way that it was designed to be put up so that it would function 
the best it could. And, and, and human beings, are, as we've said, are designed to worship God. We're designed to know him. We're designed to love him and be loved by him. So yes. we're not doing that. If we're not experiencing that, we are going to suffer, which is why, as you said, we look around and the world is just full of suffering. It's just suffering on suffering on suffering. There's a reason it's because we're living in a rebellion to a holy God and we'll never ever be fulfilled as long as we're doing that. We can, we can, we can choose not to believe like the words we're saying now, someone listening can just choose not to believe that you can use your free will to say, no, I don't agree. It doesn't make it less true. The Bible's really clear that we cannot have health we cannot survive and we cannot even live without God. Um, and, you know, it's, it's really wild that we even managed to survive. Like I managed to survive 32 years living in rebellion against my creator. Like, how did I even, I was in so much suffering. Every day was agonizing. And even when I managed to convince myself that I was fine, underneath the surface, I was just in constant pain like that emptiness, that aching, that hole in my, in my soul, it was so painful, but I had to fill it with a lot of stimulants, a lot of numbing agents, um, filling it with like codependent relationship, filling it with alcohol, filling it with sex, filling it with new age practices, just trying to like fill myself up. Um, this is why if you strip everyone's stuff away, like if you take all their belongings and their money and their um codependent relationships and all the things that make them feel safe what you find in every case is just a broken human being who desperately needs a savior who desperately needs love and who feels lonely and disconnected and this is the other reason that in the new age we get sucked into like i, I know that you angela got sucked into this like i did this idea that well i'm not from here because i feel so like painfully lonely here and I have such a deep homesick ache in my soul it must be because I'm just from another planet and like I'm an alien and I come from you know I thought I was uh from Lemuria and I was like channeling all these spirit guides from Lemuria and I was trying to like do grid work on earth to bring the new earth here and like all this 5d ascension stuff it's all such an illusion to cover up it's like trying to put this massive band-aid on this gaping god-shaped hole in your life um in your soul and uh this this is why even in new age when you think you found it then it, it, a few weeks months later oh it's kind of i need the next thing what's the next course what's the next upgrade what's the next retreat what's the next program who's the next guru that i need to listen to because i'm still empty yeah yeah, and I I love that you mentioned that um, because it's, you know, there's also the taboo of, oh, you're brainwashed now. And it's like, <laughs> I wasn't brainwashed when I thought that I came from a constellation, but you think I'm brainwashed now? <laughs> no, it's um, like when I was, when I was like painting my, <laughs> painting my menstrual blood all over my body and talking to spirit guides and like, um, telling you that I was literally God and I was going to birth like the new Gaia and raise us all into 5D. You thought I was really like awesome and everything I was saying was wisdom. And now I'm saying that there's a God who made me. You think I'm crazy? <laughs> like what? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. The, and things you know, I used to think, the things I used to say and think sound so insane. Yeah. When I look at them now. But the world, this is, you know, again, to say that Satan has deceived the whole world. It's all upside down. And the Bible says, you know, we're calling evil good and good evil, sweet, sour and sour, sweet. So it's mm -hmm. this idea that things that are actually against God and that are corrupt and that are vacuous and that are perverted and that are sinful, the world says are good. And then things that are pure and righteous mm -hmm. and holy and have to do with Jesus Christ the world says is is bad yeah it's all completely upside down and you know once you have eyes to see that once Jesus opens your eyes you can't unsee that amen <laughs> amen it's um <laughs> I mean yeah it's 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 so true right it's when when you look at the world 
like we were just saying, when you look at the world, it's everything is upside down. And it's mm -hmm. only when you have those eyes to see and that willingness to see that you can't unsee it. And it's, mm -hmm. it's just everywhere. And look, mm -hmm. that's not, you know, for the record, for anyone listening, that's not to cast judgment on anyone because, uh, you know, Nayla and I get it. You know, we get it. We understand that it feels real. It feels good. It it feels like you're doing the godly thing when you are entrenched in these new age practices. Yeah. And that's the point of deception. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, there's nothing wrong with people that are doing these things. They're not, they're not idiots. They're not stupid. They're not X, Y, Z. Although they've turned around and called me those things lately, but you know, I digress. It's, they are simply being deceived. Yes. And so we need to pray for them really, because that's all we have. That's all we can do at this point as people yeah. have prayed for us, I'm sure. Exactly. And like we, like you said, we have so much compassion and empathy because that's who we were. That's where we come from. You know, we're not like in any way above any of that now that we're saved. It's only by God's grace that we have a different perspective. We've done nothing like we we can't take any credit for what god has done in us but you know we we come from that that deception and when i was in the new age doing all of that stuff i completely believed it mm -hmm. i thought it made sense and i thought that i was helping people like i had good intentions i felt like i was a good person because i was doing those things i was trying to help and, you know, people who are deceived, like I was, are trying really hard to help and they have good intentions. That's the thing. God has made you with this, like, yes, we are sinful and our sin nature is the problem. But the way he originally made us is like this innocent desire to love and be loved. Mm -hmm. So we all try, like, to do good things. But the thing is, the Bible reveals that none of our good works, none of our trying can get us anywhere because we, we are the problem. I think you talked about this in your last podcast, you know, if, if sin and if, if mankind is the problem, we cannot be our own solution. We need a savior. We need someone who is morally perfect, who can come in and actually solve the problem for us. And that's none of us, that's Jesus Christ. So yeah, we're not judging anybody. We know how the devil always presents like 90% truth and he gives the uh he gave you that little 10% of deception you know and so you, you think this is the truth I found it but there's that little drop of poison in the water that leaven in the bread that that deception um so you know even things that seem really great like everyone loves yoga because it seems like a really healing thing to do you could argue that there are benefits to it, but there's enough deception in there that it will lead you into demonic territory and you'll end up demon possessed and you'll end up suffering because of what you're doing. But it doesn't look like that on the surface. On the surface, it looks like it's gonna make you calm and relax your mind and help you be fit. Satan is always gonna wrap sin in a nice candy wrapper. He's always gonna present it as, he's always gonna present poison as healing He's always going to present things that are wicked as good because otherwise you wouldn't go for them because you have that innate desire to be good and to love and be loved. And you have that, that innocence in there, the way God made us originally in his image um, to love him, worship him. Like he wrote his perfect law on our hearts and we have that desire to know what true love is and mm -hmm. true love is a relationship with God. But Satan will use that desire in you to find something good, to tempt you towards something that looks good, that looks like light, but it's false light. It doesn't have anything to do with Jesus Christ. It doesn't have anything to do with the God who made us. And it has everything to do with our desire to um, gratify our flesh. You know, all of all of the new age practices come down to me. I want to feel good myself, you know, I want to get fit or I want to get enlightened or I want to be more embodied and I want to experience more pleasure. It's always about me, 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 me. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good sign that we're not on the right path when it's all about us, you know. And it's not even just new age, right? It's even agnostics and atheists that they want to feel good. So they drink a lot or 
they watch porn, yeah. you know, even I would even argue that the act of rejecting God can feel good because it does give you this sense of, well, I'm my own God. Mm. I have myself to rely on. Mm. So even if you feel, even if you feel like this sense of despair, this hopelessness within, at the same time, at least you have that sense of self-reliance to somehow empower you through that misery. Yeah. So it's always, always, no matter how you spin it, no matter what walk of life, sex, gender, age, whatever may have you, there is a thirst. Mm -hmm. And 1 Peter 2.2, 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere, the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Same as Matthew 4.4, 4, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Amen. I said this in my last podcast that, you know, God feeds us our daily bread. Yeah. That is, that's how we become full. That's, I mean, that's it. <laughs> Otherwise we're spiritually starving. Yes. And that's the thing, like whether you're spiritually starving in new age, but filling yourself up with loads of junk food that just doesn't actually nourish you or whether you're spiritually starving in, you know, as an atheist or someone who completely rejects job, uh, re rejects God, you are still spiritually starving in either case. Like the only thing that can fill you and, and, and complete that thirst is the living waters of the word of God. And you can't know that unless you experience it. So I always just challenge people like, if you don't believe me, read the word because mm -hmm. you'll find that everyone who rejects God has never read the Bible, mm -hmm. just like me. <laughs> mm -hmm. When I was rejecting the God of the Bible, I I had never read a word of the Bible. Um, um, but something you said a moment ago made me think of how like, oh yeah, you said it's actually really empowering. It can feel empowering to reject God, even though it's not. Um, it made me think of like, the wounded teenager you know who rejects their parents and they they feel a sense of power when they do that you know it's like you know i don't belong to you this is my life and i don't need you and it feels really kind of good temporarily to do that when you're angry and when you're in pain um when your hormones are going crazy and you feel like everyone's trying to oppress you it feels good to push out of that mold so you can get this temporary high and this temporary satisfaction from rejecting the authority above you that loves you and actually wants to take care of you mm -hmm. but it will never last what it, it either turns into bitterness and more sorrow in your heart or it leads you to um just sin against that authority so much that there's no going back I mean I I was so rebellious I left home when I was 15 and I just rejected my family rejected my parents and it felt really empowering to do that at the beginning and then it led to a lifetime of unhealthy attachment style drug abuse like suffering because I was looking for that sense of love that I had rejected we, we need love like you said about the plant metaphor like watering the plant if we don't have love we we will die because we we need love we we can't live without it and um there's only one pure source of love and that's from god mm -hmm. and we are his children right so he yeah. is our father yeah and so it's that 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 metaphor of the rebellious teenager makes all the more sense <laughs> yeah we're literally rejecting our father and then wondering why we feel homeless <sighs> you know, I, I wanted to read to you something just an extract from something I wrote that kind of touched on that this was the Holy Spirit just wrote this through me and when I read it back I was like yeah exactly this is the homesickness like that everyone knows that ache and I can't describe it with words but everyone knows it everyone has experienced that indescribable longing for something that they can't quite put their finger on. Mm -hmm. Well, that's God that you're looking for. So I've said, we'll never be whole as long as we remain in rebellion against the God who gave us life. Mm -hmm. So we might think that we can fill ourselves with other things, but the truth is it will never be enough. 
We'll never have true peace or freedom while we continue to sin against a sinless God, our Heavenly Father. And we'll never know who we really are. You know, we're all looking for ourselves. <laughs> and uh, we'll never know who we really are as long as we reject the God who knit us together in our mother's womb and knows every hair on our head. Like he made us. We won't know who we are if we don't know who he is. He's our creator. And we'll never stop feeling homesick as long as we deny the God who made us in his image to walk with him and to be in fellowship with him. And we'll never feel happy as long as we are apart from the lover of our soul. You know, how could we ever feel complete when we are so fractured, if we're separated from our creator? Um, you know, so because man loves sin and because God hates sin, we do remain separate from him. Um, so I think that's also worth us talking about because we can talk about different ways people reject God, but the real reason that anyone rejects God is because they love their sin more than they love him. <laughs> yes. And that's, that's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. That's a hard pill for the self-righteous mind. Um, yeah. But that... But then it comes back to just the question, you know, you know, if there's someone listening to this that may feel that way and may feel some resistance to what we're saying, it's how's that working for you? You know, mm -hmm. how how is that working for you? Really, really be yeah. honest with yourself in that question. Mm -hmm. Loving your sin, rejecting God, doing it on your own. How is that working? <laughs> yeah, it works until it doesn't. And how can, you know, how can you ever really be filled by something that breaks God's heart? You know, it's like sin breaks God's heart. It separates us from him. So even though it feels good to our flesh, how can doing something that breaks the heart of our creator ever really fulfill us? It, it can't. And I think, you know, I understand that it's hard to let go of the sin you love because if you haven't known anything else then you feel like that's your only comfort maybe in this life and life is hard you know we all need comfort but we're supposed to be comforted by the lover of our soul you know he when you're born again you are given the holy spirit who is called the comforter like you are given um the love and the protection and the provision and the nurturing and and the care that your soul's always been longing for so you know if you're someone who didn't get that from your parents or from your you know you didn't get the love and the protection you needed as a child then looking for that in relationship or in sex or in a career or in drugs it will never fulfill you you need to get that love from the source of love which is your your true father your heavenly father and um, it's so wonderful when you see people who, you know, we're all broken. We're all sinners when we come to the Lord. And when you see people coming from um, a background of having not had healthy parents, having not had healthy love in their lives, and then they, they finally get to experience what true love is through Jesus with their creator to feel God's love. And you see, you see someone's whole soul just transformed because what they're like a shriveled plant and then they get water <laughs> and it's like love you know it it it's like water in a desert you know to have one drop of god's love um it's everything so i think you know it, it can be hard to explain that to someone uh, you know it's not an intellectual process this is a divine revelation of who God is that happens when you surrender to him when you choose to um, turn towards him and repent of your sin um, but I I always say to people who are cynical well just try it and if it doesn't work out then you can go back to all of your sin and your endless seeking if you want to but you won't want to <laughs> mm -hmm. if you give it an honest try and yeah. And that it's not just, it's not going to church. It's not reading the Bible. It's a surrender to mm -hmm. God. That's yeah. what it is. That's what we mean when we say try. Yes. Um, it's not, you know, 
putting on the costume of religion. It's surrendering mm -hmm. and repenting and giving yourself to him. It's really scary because it's laying down your life and saying, mm -hmm. God, I'm not God, you are. Yes. And I'm going to stop being the God in my own life and stop being in control. And it's really vulnerable. You know, we're all control freaks whilst we're trying to operate apart from God. Like you have to actually give up that control and that's scary. Um, but you know, everything that truly is worth anything in this life requires sacrifice. And when you sacrifice yourself for God, you, the Bible talks about how whenever we surrender and sacrifice things to God we he will he will multiply like we will be rewarded in in kind and more um so when you give yourself over to to the God who made you um oh he blesses you beyond measure you know it's so worth it it's so worth it um even in the suffering it's worth it you know Jesus says anyone who wants to follow after me has to pick up their cross and deny themselves so it's not he's not promising it's going to be easy to walk with him and know him um but the fulfillment of of having that god-shaped hole finally filled with the love you long for is worth everything it's worth sacrificing anything and everything for indeed matthew 6 33 but seek ye first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you and I used to, you know, as I was preparing for this podcast, I thought back to, I know you're from London, so I'm not sure if you've heard of it. The Columbine massacre that happened in 99, where, um, oh, oh, okay. Oh, all right. We're good. Still there. Oh, I don't, sorry. I don't know what happened. I got kicked out. Oh, that was scary. Okay. We're good though. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the Columbine massacre that happened in 99, where, the shooter came into the school. I, I had read this book in high school called She Said Yes. And it was about the the, mo the mother of the of the teenage girl wrote it about how the girl was hiding under the desk. And, you know, the witnesses around saw this happen where she had been praying underneath her desk and the shooter came up to her and made her or tried to make her say she didn't believe in God and say, you know, reject God. And she and he said, do you believe in God? And she said, yes. And he shot her in the head. Wow. And I remember when I read that in high school thinking, why wouldn't you just lie? Why wouldn't you just say no? You know, mm -hmm. but I honestly get it. Yeah. Because that love is, I mean, there's been so many times in this podcast I've, that you and I have been speaking. I've been on the verge of tears because that mm -hmm. love is impeccable. And truly when you really surrender to him, when you really put your faith in him and your life in his hands, and he just pours that love onto you, you will never be the same. Amen. And he would die for it, truly. Not yeah. as a martyr, but just as a as an act of unconditional love, just as Jesus did. Yes. Yeah, it's the same. Like anyone who has children can can relate to that kind of love. It's like the closest that we can get to imagining how God how much God loves us is the way that a mother loves her child you know it's you would do anything for them you would throw yourself in front of a bullet for them you would throw yourself under a bus for them you just love them and god loves us like that but a million times magnified right. you know and so when you experience a direct stream a direct like fountain of god's love I mean, it's more than life. You you want it more than life, and you would even give your own life to have it. It's so, it's it's everything. It's so powerful. It's so healing, and it's just everything you've ever longed for. Like if you could, if someone listening to this could imagine their wildest dream, like the thing that they long for the most, and they just think that when they get that thing, they're going to be happy. Like that, your your absolute ultimate wildest dream, your fantasy of perfection in this life knowing Jesus Christ knowing the father knowing God is like getting every single thing that your soul has ever longed for but you don't get any like worldly stuff it's about you know suddenly you don't care about the, the money or the career or the, 
the thing that you want to have something that is beyond measure you have a treasure beyond measure and that's the love of your creator yes and it's as we said you know it's not that other things in the world aren't interesting anymore it's just that it's not the fulfillment no and so as we begin to wrap up here would you share in your own life what has changed for you and i know the answer is everything but what has changed for you since allowing god to fill that void hmm. who are you then versus now with that well i mean i suppose the the biggest difference that i experience every day and that other people also notice about me is that i have peace now and peace is like inner peace is like the mecca of new age you know we're all seeking inner peace through yoga and through meditation and mindfulness and all the things and i was really looking for that inner peace um but nothing i did i i never found it and now I experience a peace, like the Bible says, a peace that is beyond understanding, that nothing can shake it. Like it doesn't matter what happens outside of me. Um, I could be having the worst day of my life or the best day of my life. It doesn't make a difference. It's like no matter what's happening on the surface, there's this peace underneath. There's this continuous stream of peace that is supernaturally given that doesn't run out and it doesn't fluctuate. You know, in the new age, I was so up and down, up and down, highs and lows, emotional roller coaster. And now it's not that I don't feel intensely. It's not that I don't have bad days, but there's this peace that is beyond understanding. That is like a constant comfort to my soul. And it's always with me, even when my external situation, external circumstances change. Um, and that's the thing I'm the most grateful for because life is not easy. Life is hard. And when you walk through this broken world, it's painful because life is so hard for all of us. And we're all struggling with burdens that we can't even imagine. We don't know what the other one is going through and everyone is suffering with something. Um, and to be able to just have the comfort of godly peace in your heart is it makes me feel like a billionaire because it's mm -hmm. like there's nothing that that is more supportive to to being alive I feel so grateful that God is with me every day and that if I need help I can cry out to him and he always answers prayer like if I ask for his help he immediately is by my side and he his spirit strengthens me comforts me soothes me guides me like it's it's such a privilege to walk with him and to have him care about me and to take care of me it's just it's wonderful and as someone who came from a broken home and who didn't have that sense of safety in my childhood and then led a very broken life of rebellion and sin and displacement and homelessness and abuse and addiction and all the things that I went through before I came to know God before Jesus saved me, my life is completely different on, on the inside because there's like this calm fullness. That God-shaped hole has been filled by God and he fits perfectly in there. <laughs> so I have everything I need and that doesn't mean that my life is easy, but it does mean that my life is blessed and I'm so grateful. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Before we end, I wanted to, because you reminded me how I've spoken on this before, when I would do moon rituals and meditations, yoga practices, moments where I was trying to regulate, I would feel this ache within this so deep, like, and it was always my heart chakra, right? You know, I'm using air quotes for those listening, my heart <laughs> chakra that was trying to crack open. Mm -hmm. When I first spoke with my pastor and he prayed for me and lifted me to the Lord, it was the first time I had ever done any sort of like meditative, if you will, sort of spiritual practice where I did not feel that. Mm -hmm. And I know now in hindsight, I was feeling that void. I was feeling the God-shaped hole. Yes. And so I just pray that anyone listening or watching 
will be willing to stop trying to fit the triangles and the squares and just let God do his work and let his grace come upon you. So Nayla, would you do us the honor of closing out in prayer? Yes, I'd love to. Hmm. Oh, Father God, thank you so much for this time, for this conversation. Lord, I just lift up to you every single person that's been listening, every single person that will hear this podcast. I pray, Lord, that you would meet with them in a mighty way. I pray that you would touch their heart, Lord. I pray that you would help them to see that that longing they have, that deep hunger they have for things and people and stuff, that that longing is really a longing for you, that it's you they hunger for, Lord. Help them to know that they can cry out to you, their creator, they can ask for the help they need. Help them to know that you're there, Lord. I pray that you'd make your presence felt to them and draw them to yourself. Help them to stop trying to fit all of the, those worldly things, those fleshly things into the God-shaped void in their soul. Help them to cry out to the one who gave them life, you, Lord. Help them to know that you are real and that you love them. And I pray, Lord, that you would have um, a divine and, and powerful encounter with every single person who's heard this podcast. And maybe it, it won't be something that happens immediately, Lord, but I pray you work on them. I pray that you remove their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh, Lord. I pray you unblind their eyes and give them eyes to see you, Lord, eyes to see your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray that this conversation will bless everyone who hears it. And I'm so grateful for this time with Angela. I lift her up to you, Lord. I pray you bless this ministry and I thank you for all you're doing in her life. And most of all, Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that he came to earth to die on a cross for our sins so that we could know you, so we could be reconciled to you, so that we could have salvation. And so that we could come back to um, our father, our creator and be made whole. So I pray all of these things with so much gratitude, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been so wonderful. And I'm really, I feel really emotional just talking about how blessed we are. It's just, it's really good to share and to have fellowship and talk about it because you are so so blessed and when you speak it you really become aware of just how good god is <laughs> amen 